Hello, everyone, and welcome to High Rights webinar. The 10 things that you can do today to improve the quality and quantity of drivers recruited. Our guest speaker today is Kelly Anderson from Impact Training Solutions. I'm Kent Ferguson, the Director of Transportation Solutions for High Right. And before we get started, I need to go over a couple of housekeeping items. We will be recording the webinar today and each of you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the presentation. The recording will be available for you to view up to 90 days. We will not be providing copies of the slides, but you may share the recording link with your colleagues who might find the information helpful. This webinar is pre-approved for one general recertification credit towards a professional human resources, senior professional human resources, and global professional human resources through the HR Certification Institute. To receive credit, you must attend the entire live event. I'm having some trouble advancing the slide, bear with me. Okay, if you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking the reload refresh button or by pressing F5 on your keyboard. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a bar with various icons. This bar controls all components of the webinar, including the volume. This is where you can ask a question as well as find help for any issues you may experience. If you are experiencing technical difficulties that cannot be addressed through the help section, please let us know that through the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and someone will assist you. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce today's guest speaker, Mr. Kelly Anderson. Kelly has worked in the transportation industry for the past 27 years. The various positions he has held include federal law enforcement officer, professional driver, driver trainer, driver recruiter, safety supervisor, and safety manager over a recruiting department for a 700 truck fleet. Using these experiences, Kelly founded Impact Training Solutions in January 1998. Through his real world solution-based training, Kelly has become one of the transportation industry's most sought after speakers trainers. Kelly founded the International Society of Recruiting and Retention Professionals, co-founded the three largest recruiting and retention conferences in North America, and the Transportation Training and Development Institute at Kakaskia College. He is chairman of the Transportation Training and Development Institute, an adjunct professor for two colleges, is on the board of directors for the Truckload Carriers Association, the Missouri Trucking Association, and he's a member of the Recruitment and Retention Human Resource Committee for the TCA and the ATA. So I can't think of anyone more qualified to speak on today's subject than Kelly, so I'm going to turn it over to him now. Kent, I, I appreciate that. and. Uh, um, yeah, it was a 1,720 truck fleet. I, I was just sitting there thinking, man, they, they just shrunk in there in the middle of that. <laughs> anyway, I, next time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you the uh, paraphrased version of that intro. But, hey, I, I want to thank you, Kent and, and Sharon and all the, the great folks at, at Higher Right for, for setting this up and giving me the opportunity 
to, to speak to the audience today. Folks, I created this presentation, you know, when we started talking about what's a good topic that we could share, well, one of the things we're seeing is, is this driver shortage is, is just going through the roof. And, um, you know, people are asking, you know, where do I find drivers? How can I get them? And, and I, um, first thing I want to say is that the numbers that are out there, you know, they're saying there's 39,000 drivers short today. And, you know, in the next by t next seven, eight years, it would be 239,000 drivers short. Folks, we have felt 39,000 drivers short before. I think that that number is actually low. Uh, I think that there is, uh, we're way north of 39,000 drivers short today. And um, so I, I'm getting hired a lot with people, you know, saying, hey, we need help finding drivers, we need help recruiting drivers, and help retaining drivers. And so as I put together this presentation, um, I drew on the, the top ten things that I see as I go around the country consulting with fleets, the top ten things I see them doing uh, that are adversely affecting their ability to add drivers. And so let's, let's just go and, and get right into this. And Ken, I'm having the same problems you were, so I'll push it another way. There we go. So. Um, you know, the very first thing, uh, strategy number one would be to remove the distractions that take recruiters away from recruiting. Now, I'm going to talk to this point in two ways. Uh, first is this point is um, for companies that, that have a recruiting department. Uh, when you have recruiters and, and they are focused on recruiting, and for those of you that are smaller fleets and you wear a lot of hats, I'm going to talk to you in just a second. But um, when I see recruiters... Um, that are focused on recruiting, but, well, sort of focused. You know, they are also teaching orientation and or they're taking care of this little side project or that side project. You know, the other day I was at a fleet and I heard the recruiting line was ringing and I, and I looked to see where the recruiters were. Well, the recruiters were over putting together orientation packets. And, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm working on, you know, one was working on building the orientation packets, another one was cleaning out a closet, and their idea was, well, we, yeah, we'll get to that call later. I know there's probably a lot of folks on this call right now that are falling over in their chair, but uh, absolutely, that's exactly what was going on. And I've seen that more times than not, that if people have, and this, this is, you know, recruiting is a sales job, and if people have a job that will take them away from sales, it typically will. And so if at all possible, have a recruiter that is 100% focused on recruiting. That's what they do, and so, you know, they're going to make the most out of every lead, get, be there to answer the calls live, and, and so on. Um, for those of you that um, there are some, many on the phone, I'm sure, that you wear a lot of hats because of the size of your fleet. Uh, you're the safety director, the orientation instructor. You might even do paying, uh, you know, payroll. And, and on top of that, we've also got to do um, to take the recruiting calls. Um, and I understand that's a reality for you. And, and I want to just mention this lightly. And if anybody's interested in knowing more about it, then give me a call. Uh, I have recently started a recruiting call center to help fleets like that. Um, our, one of the fleets we have on right now uh, is actually an intermodal fleet, and they have multiple terminals, and the safety directors wear the recruiting hat and all those things. So what happens is the live recruiting calls um, come in to our recruiting call center. We answer it as, we're, as if we're that fleet, do the um, initial pre-screen of the drivers, and then do hot transfers to our point of contact. So there are point of contacts only having to talk to the highly qualified drivers, not all the ones that don't qualify. And so um, I really hesitated to have that as the first slide because I, I typically, I don't want this to come with self-promotion, but, you know, a real solution to a real problem for real folks uh, that are trying to wear all the different hats. You're not big enough to have a full-blown recruiter yet. So um, anyway, I, talk to you, I can talk more about that when anybody wants to. Um, but th there's two things. If you have full-blown recruiters, focus on recruiting. If you're not, then um, you know, maybe there's another way you can do it in-house. You're taking that idea I just built, 
you know, is there a clerical type of person in your organization that could take those initial calls? And but we don't. Here's the deal: if if you do it in house, you don't want it to the applicant to feel like they just got pre-screened. Oh, let me send you to the recruiter. When we do a hot transfer to our point of contact, we tell the applicant, wow, John, I don't see any reason that we couldn't take this next level. As a matter of fact, I know that the vice president of safety would like to visit with you right now if you, if you have time. I'd like to put you in touch with them. And then they say, oh, absolutely. So then we do an introduction. The vice president of safety talks to them. The, 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 the applicant feels like, wow, I am so important and so special that they just escalated me up the food chain uh, to the person that, that can really make the decision on this and get this going. Um, so definitely don't make them feel pre-screened. They don't like that. Um, but they do like feeling like they're important and that you escalated them. And so anyway, we can talk about that more. Anybody wants to give me a call and we can talk about it. Um, strategy number two, uh, you know, I put in here utilize an ad agency. Uh, when I see people trying to do their own advertising, they are, you know, we're so busy doing other things, many times uh, a couple things happen. We just keep going with the same ad that we used before. Uh, you know, you call the paper, hey, you know, place, place that ad for me. Yeah, run it again. Just, just run it again. And, and so you just keep the same thing going. But, you know, are we, you know, folks – you and I are not ad, are not advertising experts. There are people that are, and they understand about you know the different medias and how to get the best bang for your buck, how to get your ad noticed. They understand how to how to program all the Google Analytics into a landing page so we can see where the traffic came from. We can see their fingerprints as they go through your site. We can see where they went and where they didn't go. If they didn't take it to the nth degree, when, where did they stop? And start trying to figure out why did they stop. And then we can see where they went beyond there. You know, where did they click out at? So you know, tracking is paramount, and the way, the, the the way to to get that tracking is through an expert in that field putting those type of things into your landing pages and into your websites. Um, the other day, I was at a fleet and I was doing recruiter coaching. I'd done the recruiter training, and um, and so now I'm sitting with recruiters to to make phone calls, and. Ask the um, you know say hey let's let's get Ramsey Media Works to do some pay, some Craigslist for us let's get this going and um, well the guy thought he could do it himself and well he so he placed it himself and we didn't get anything so later on I called and uh, and said hey called in a favor over at Ramsey and said hey would you guys do me a couple of Craigslist for this market and next thing you know the phone the phone started ringing so uh, and they were they were calling off the ad that we had placed. So, you know, although you say, oh, I, I've done Craigslist, I know how to do that, I can do it myself. Really? <laughs> so uh, there are tricks to that trade, getting them to stick and getting them saw uh, or seen and, and getting people, you know, making it the type of message that makes people want to take, a, um, take action um, on, the, on it as well. So, but the other thing, when you, if you're talking to an ad agency, um, Make sure they have your best interest at heart. Uh, I have found many that uh, they have other relationships that are more important to them than yours, and so that you know they 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 post a lot of advertising on with one source and, and or one group. And hey, if that's what's best for you, then I'm all about it. But um, there's other sources that that they won't even rec recommend. Um, and why? Because they have a burn their saddle for that for that provider. But you know what? There's there there is a provider I had a burn my saddle for. The guy got sideways in my face, accused me of something I didn't do. Later, he figured out that he was wrong. Uh, his cohorts apologized. He's not the type of guy to do that. But you know what? I still recommend them every day to 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 our clients. Why? Because he's good for the client. Um, so. Look, look. Make sure that that the advice that you're getting is is from an agency that has your best interest at heart. You know, I, I was working with the fleet, a fleet, another fleet the other day, and um, they they were trying to do their own advertising, and 
And so it ended up they had a you know they're talking to these people that have magazines and, and websites, and these people over here have some radio, and these people have some TV and some billboards, and so you end up with this whole hodgepodge, no real campaign going on, uh, and as a result, they were spending a lot of money. Uh, we're about to I say we are I have a strategic partnership with Ramsey. Uh, Ramsey is about to take over that account, and we can see two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year off that budget immediately, and then through tracking and reporting, we can see how to continue to, um, to tweak that message and continue to drive that cost per, uh, advertising cost per hire down and, and lower that recruiting budget. Um, digital recruiting, is it's the number one places, place that drivers go to find a job. Um, and the neat thing about it is it is immediate results. We can test the message with it, and um, it's low cost. And like I say, it's immediate. Uh, when we just last Wednesday, we had a, 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 a client that, um, you know, we we're firing them up into the recruiting call center. And um, uh, come, was it Wednesday morning, uh, we finally got the go. And I called Ramsey and said, all right, place it. Within 10 minutes, we started receiving phone calls off the Craigslist ads that were placed. It's that immediate. By the way, some drivers will program their phone so that when certain types of jobs hit the Craigslist in their area, it auto notifies them that that hit. And that, so that's one, one way that it drives immediate results. Uh, I can tell you there's a lot of agencies, talking about agencies that are willing to do what's right for you. There's a lot of agencies and people on this phone, on this, um, on this webinar, I'm sure you've heard them. So, ah, oh, you can't do that. It doesn't work, and, and it, it's illegal to do it. Well, you can do that. It works phenomenally, and it's not illegal to do it. We have a letter from their attorney telling us what we're doing is legal. Um, Pay-per-click. Uh, I think I said this in our last webinar. I'll say it, I want to say it here. Um, Pay-per-click is just that. It should only cost you if people click on you. Um, I, I've heard... Some folks out there saying, hey, we got a pay-per-click thing. And then this one client called me and said, yeah, I spent $10,000 on pay-per-click last month, got two clicks, and now they're wanting another $10,000. I said, don't do it. That's not pay-per-click. What in the world are they charging you for? You know, if, if you had a, a $10,000 budget, which was a pretty sizable budget, um, especially for, you know, for many of the folks that are on the call, um, if you had a $10,000 budget, Here's the thing, you know, when we put you out on the search engines or banners on other sites or remarketing, I, I, hang, uh, this whole remarketing, I'll talk about that in a second, which is, it's it's pay-per-click model, but I want to talk about it se separate. Um, so when people search certain keywords, we can geographically fence where those people can see your advertising. Um, so it's not like you're going to get clicks from all over the world. You know, for instance, this intermodal fleet that, that we, um, uh, we we started some PPC for um, that we're doing on the call center. You know, we have geographically fenced that right around three of their intermodal um, locations. So, you know, we're not getting hit from from everywhere else in the country. Just right there where we need drivers from. So you can geographically fence it. People see your banner. If they don't click on you, it doesn't cost you a dime. You only pay when they click on it and, they, and then takes them to your landing page. I keep saying landing page. That's like a corporate website that is um, specific to driver recruiting. You know, if somebody's looking for a pair of shoes, do you want to drop them out, at, 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 out in, in the parking lot of the mall or do you want to send them into the, into the shoe store? Uh, we use a landing page. You know, people are looking for a job. We put them right where that where they want to be with the information uh, that they need. So only when they click on the on the banner do you actually pay. And so it takes that piece of money. We can limit um, the budget spent per day. We can set the time of days that it shows up as well. So it's not like you're opening your checkbook. If somebody has come to you and says, "Yeah, I need ten thousand dollars," and and you know, and they're not and it's not tied to the fact that you only pay when they click, then that's not truly a PPC and, and run, don't walk, run away. Remarketing. 
I was in a meeting this morning with the fleet, and the gentleman was, um, we were talking about advertising. It was actually Todd Ramsey and I were visiting with this gentleman, and uh, he said, you know, last night he was, he was looking for a, um, for a pickup. And he'd actually looked at six different dealerships' websites. And I said, well, you want to see what remarketing is? Go to this website. And I just named one. He went to the website, and I said, well, look what's on top of that. And Chevrolet pickup sitting right there. <laughs> and so that's remarketing. Uh, we're able to know what you're searching for. And so when, you, when there's a person that is looking for what you have, then we're able to put that banner right in front. And so all these different sites that they go to, there you are. And I, I am pegged as an owner-operator because of the amount of searching I do for owner-operator things. And uh, I don't know why the owner-operator is, is stronger than what I do for company driver, but it is. And so a lot of the sites that I go to, there are owner-operator ads on those sites um, trying to, trying to, to get my, my attention. And again, it doesn't cost you anything unless you click on it. You know. So because it's just me seeing it that isn't costing the fleet anything more than just the basic placement fee um, or setup fee. It, it, the only re the only way it could cost them part of their PPC budget is if I actually click on that banner. So I talked about Craigslist, uh, YouTube. We use those for driver testimonials, and that's the strongest recruiting message you have out there are your drivers uh, telling their success story. Uh, when we do landing pages, we put links to the um, on, on the landing page to the YouTube video so, so that the landing page loads quickly, but we still get the benefit of a YouTube video. Um, you know, social media, when I think about uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and such, um, the same thing, we can do a, PP, uh, a PPC uh, campaign on social media. On the portal sites, um, the, you know, there are multiple types of, of portal sites. The, uh, the first I call database sites. These are the sites where drivers, you know, you pay to be on the site, drivers fill out the application, and everybody and their brother gets a copy of that uh, application. And so you'll get hundreds of applications a week from that site. Well, the guy didn't, he wasn't specifically interested in your company. You just got a copy of it because you paid to be on the site. And hey, there's a place for those. I prefer to put them into my drip marketing campaign. So put them in my database and start email drip marketing to them so then they call me specifically interested in what I have to offer. Um, if I have plenty of the other direct leads that I want to generate, then, um, th then that works real well because then I turn those folks into, uh, into direct leads. Now, on portal sites, we can buy banners. And so, you know, then they click on that banner, goes to your landing page, and becomes a direct applicant. Um, the next type of portal site is what I call a filtered site. You know, truckdriver.com is a great filtered site. You know, the driver fills out an application. He, his application goes through a filter, says, oh, you meet this person's criteria. And which ones would you like it to go to? And then they can click on multiple fleets, and then you get a copy of the app. I will tell you, when we take over advertising clients, um, we find that the last time a company's profile on recruiting on these, on these portal sites was updated was the first time that they got on the site. Uh, Ramsey has, has staff that validates the data that's on our client's profile on these sites every month to make sure that, we, that it's always up to date. Um, garbage in, garbage out. So you want, you know, make sure that your profile is up to date on, on these websites, or that or the apps you're getting won't be applicable. So um, I'm going to go to the next, the next piece here. But you know, there, there's so much to talk about when you start talking about advertising and tracking, uh, and reporting, and then the message. Um, highly recommend the use of a professional agency to do that. Um, this. This point is for it is for the larger fleets, and, and I won't belabor it. I, I know there's hundreds. Uh, there was 700 and some odd people signed up for this webinar, um, and so we're going to have people of all different sizes here. 
Uh, when I am called into a fleet and they're like, hey, we have company, we take company drivers, owner operators, students, um, and or you know, many fleets now are saying I'll take company and students. If you have multiple recruiters, assign primary recruiting responsibilities. If your policy is, hey, you guys recruit whoever, whoever's on the phone, you recruit them. What will happen is recruiters will migrate toward the easiest hire. And all at once, you've got all these students, and you don't have any experienced drivers or no, no owner operators. Every time I've worked with the fleet, and you know, for, I'll say to them, well, how many, you know, what, what do we need for turnover? Just to keep up the turnover, well, how many drivers do we need? Okay. Then how many owner operators would you want to add this week? How many students, what type of mix do you want in your fleet with students? And so we, we figure out those numbers. Well, then I, I have a, a template that, will, that shows, um, you know, based on, you know, how many drivers you want, how many, you know, how many company drivers can a recruiter recruit per week. So depending on how many drivers you need tells me how many recruiters you need. And, you know, when to add a processor or when to add another recruiter, this, this little table outlines that for folks. And same with owner-operators. And if anybody wants a copy of that, I'd be glad to, glad to share it with you. The, um, so what I do in using that experience, I tell them, you need to focus, you know, two recruiters on the company drivers, one recruiter on owner-operator, and one on students. Now... Although the company driver recruiters, that's their primary recruiting responsibility, if the owner-operator recruiter is on the phone, then they take that call. And then vice versa, if the student recruiter, although they're doing students, if the company driver recruiter is on the phone, then they take that call. And so we back each other up. But there's this pride of ownership. And, and so what happens is people get excited about the, the owning their type of driver, and then you'll start seeing all the numbers coming up like you want them to instead of being lopsided um, with, with one type of driver or the, or the next. I also put on here Internet. And the reason I do that um, is, you know, if you have a lot of phone calls coming into your group, which still digital drives a lot of phone calls. Guys will see the ad online and then they'll dial the number. Um, if you have a lot of phone calls coming in, I find that Internet leads don't get worked. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I do, a lot of people don't realize I do this, and I think I'm going to do a webinar on this at some point, Kent, um, and definitely a keynote that I do at national, uh, national associations. Uh, I do this thing called Undercover Trucker. So I get hired by a fleet to go through their entire recruiting process as a truck driver, through their entire orientation process as a truck driver, and then we blow the cover at the end. And one of these days, maybe I'll have my own reality TV show. But anyway, we're not there yet. <laughs> but what happens is I, I fill out Internet inquiries. Uh, many times I'll make the phone call first. Hey, I was wondering if he's hiring drivers. And they'll go, yeah, we sure are. And then I say, well, what can you tell me about it? Well, where do you live? Do you have any tickets? Do you have any accidents? How much experience do you have? And then they call me a liar. I call that the interrogation part. Then they call me a liar. They go, well, if, you're t if everything you're telling me is true, then we've got. And then they did the spray and pray part. Uh, we've got blah, 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 blah. And then it ends with, well, if you have any more uh, questions, you know, give me a call. Or when I push... They typically will say, hey, yeah, you know, go on the Internet, fill out our application, and I'll get back to you. Oh, okay. So I go out, fill out the application, and I wait. And I wait. And I'll typically wait until Monday or Tuesday of the week before I'm supposed to be in orientation, and I call and say, hey, I was wanting to check on my application. Folks, when I, when I apply, you know, that's 17 years with the same company, no tickets, no accidents, no criminal. You know, absolutely cream of the crop driver, and it's me who has to call back. And then they go through their big old list, and they find my application in there, and the next thing you know, you know, I'm, I get cleared to go to work. And why does that happen? Because people are so busy answering the phone, they're letting Internet leads sit unworked. 
Um, so I can tell you, if I was sitting in a recruiting department today, I would ask my boss if I could be the focused recruiting uh, Internet recruiter because I'm starting with what everybody else is trying to get, a full-blown application. You know, the fourth strategy is, is in training the recruiters. Most recruiters have never had any sales training. And as a result, as, I, as, as we make phone calls to companies and, and as we do training, I find that most companies, most recruiters do exactly what I just described. The guy calls in and says, hey, I wonder if you're hiring drivers. And the recruiter says, yep, we sure are. And then they, then they go silent. Then the applicant says, well, what can you tell me about it? So then the recruiter says, well, where do you live? Do you have any experience? Do you know what type of uh, tickets, accidents? And then they call him a liar. Then they spray and pray. Um, it's, it's the same old, same old everywhere we go. Where, so, so I'm all about provide some training to these folks. You're spending big bucks to make those phones ring, and you're losing massive dollars for trucks sitting against the fence. It costs, most companies um, desire about $650 per day in gross revenue on a truck. So count the trucks on the fence, multiply it by 650 bucks, and you'll start seeing how important this is real quick. Um, so, and when you look at the driver shortage we're in, it, it's, you know, we got to make the most out of every lead that we receive. So, um, next, you know, so I say the, the, the um, give training. Utilize conversational recruiting techniques, not the interrogation. You know, my style of recruiting is a guy calls in, hey, I wonder if he's hiring drivers. Yeah, we sure are. Who am I talking to? Oh, this is John. Hey, John, I appreciate you calling. By the way, how would you hear about us? You know, get the ad source. Well, John, tell me a little about yourself, where you've been working, what you've been doing. His answer to that tells me if he's an owner-operator, company driver, or a student. And he'll say, well, I've been driving the last 15 years, and I'm working over here right now. It's not working out. Oh, really? Well, how long have you been there? Why is it not working out? And so real quickly, I'm finding out what type of experience he has. I find out how long he's been at his current employer, what the problem is. Folks, I look at every benefit of working for your company like a piece of candy. And each benefit is a different flavor of candy. And so I don't reach into my bowl of candy until I know the flavor that, that he likes. And when you offer somebody a, a piece of candy that they like, they go, oh, yes, I'll take that. Thank you. You know, yesterday one of my staff walked in with a bowl of, I guess, I don't know, let me look. Was it Halloween or Christmas candy? It's a, uh, oh, it's Valentine candy. You can hear me rifling through it. You might t take by that point that I took some of it. <laughs> I took all the Twix and all the Snickers out of that bowl of candy, <laughs> and she was glad to let me have it. So you know if you offer me a Twix or a Snickers, it's going to get gone. And so, oh, thank you. But there was other pieces of candy in that bowl that, although she offered it, I had no interest. And the same is true in in our recruiting process, if I'm talking about what he's interested in, he's engaged, he wants it. If I'm talking about things he's not interested in, he's, he's disengaging and he's pushing it away. So I, I'm I actually using conversational techniques. I find out what he's interested in, and I give him those pieces of candy, and he, he wants to take it to the next step. Here is where I see people failing. They don't take it to the next step. On, on every phone call, when you get down to the end, folks, we've got to be the first to show acceptance. So, you know, I'm looking at this. I've got a couple of years of experience uh, that he's talked about. I've got, uh, you know, tickets, accidents that he's told me about. Everything looks fine. So I'm going to say to him, man, John, i got to tell you, based on what I'm seeing here, I don't see any reason we can't take this next step. As a matter of fact, I mean, it sounds like you'd want to start. When on the uh, 17th? If you're right, he says yes. If you're wrong, he asks you when the next date is. And so he says, it's the 23rd. That'd be great. All right. I tell you what. Let's work toward you getting here on the 23rd. I'm going to put you on the board for the 23rd, and here's what we need to do. And, folks, if one of the most important things I'm going to tell you today is plan of action. Before you hang up, every single time with the driver, 
say to them, I'm going to do this, you're going to do this, and I want you to call me at this time. Don't be ambiguous. And the reason I say I want you to call me is because that way I only have to call back the ones that don't call me, and I keep my phone loaded with the people I want to talk to. But the, one of the big things I see where, where people are dropping the ball is they don't offer any reason for the guy not to call another recruiter, and they don't set up a plan of action uh, that is specific of, hey, John, i tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, so you have Internet access. I'm going to send you a link right now. I'm going to send you an email with a link to our online application. So you're going to fill that. So you said you'd fill that out at 3 o'clock. And i tell you what, why don't, I'm going to send it to you. You fill it out at 3 o'clock. Can you give me a call as soon as you finish that? Because um, that way I can look at it, see if there's anything else that I need, and we can get this thing started. So he calls you after he sends it in. You're like, yeah, I see it right here. I'm, I already ordered your reports. These things look good because higher rate reports are instantaneous, most of them. And so you're able to tell right away um, what's, what's looking good here. If you have any questions, you can ask them about it. Okay, John, so you're going to get that piece of information from me. I'm going to continue with the employment verification, and I've ordered your other reports that, that they'll be in tomorrow, and I will. Uh, so call me at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Every time we talk, a plan of action, and folks, that will help you a bunch to capturing these, these folks and getting them in your truck. The uh, next see, thing that, that I see really hurts recruiting is when recruiters are not empowered. And you know, I, am, I am an advocate of tell your recruiters within these parameters, you are, you know, if, he has, if the driver has these, qual these qualifications, set them up. If they don't have these qualifications, cut bait. If they're on the fence, Bring them to me and let's talk about it. I find recruiters that will actually order all the consumer reports, verify all the employment, and get the entire file put together to bring it to the person that can approve the file to prove to them that the guy doesn't qualify. And that is a huge waste of time and money. And while you're working on that guy that doesn't qualify, you're missing out on the ones that do. So. In uh, the other side is, you know, I just said a moment ago, a way to include, increase your close rate is for the recruiter to say, man, John, based on what I'm seeing here, I don't see any reason we can't take this next step. Recruiters that aren't empowered can't do that, and they don't do that. And so they let the drivers hang up without any reason not to call anybody else, and the end result is you lose out on great drivers, and you end up having to bottom feed against what's left. So that, that is a huge point um, for anybody that has somebody working with them. Am I saying, I'm talking about any supervisor that has recruiters working underneath them, am I saying that, that, that safety shouldn't have a final say-so? Absolutely not. But here's the deal. We have clearly defined hiring criteria. And let's, let, let's, let's, let's make those to also be consistent. Because I can, once I know how you think, I know what the criteria is, I know what our goal is, and I know how you think, then I can make decisions in, in alignment with that. I cannot hit a moving target. You know, you're in a bad mood today, or the truck count changed, so the criteria changed. We can't hit a moving target. And that is, uh, that's a very dangerous thing and a very hard thing to defend when, if there's an accident. So... Um, have consistent hiring criteria and empower your, rec your recruiters within those criteria. Um, so on this one, it's short in the recruiting cycle, and I've, I've kind of uh, hit this a little bit, especially the point where I talk about give a contingent offer on the first call. When I say to an applicant, man, John, based on what I'm seeing here, I don't see any reason I couldn't take this to the next level. That's a contingent offer. It's showing acceptance to them. Um, you know, when I say respond to all applicants, that's related as well to where we see uh, phone calls, you know, going into voicemails. We see Internet leads 
stacking up in, in an inbox that, that are not getting worked at all. Um, so you know, the time, the, the recruiting cycle is the time from the very first contact until a contingent offer of employment is made. And so if, if they hang up that first call and they don't have a reason not to call another company, they're going to call another company. I was out at ATA and uh, visiting with different presidents of different companies, uh, and this was one president says, man, I tell you what, we wish when they came to orientation they would cancel their cell, cell phone service. You know, right now we have the policy that they can't have their cell phones on in class uh, because basically all day long their phones were ringing from other recruiters trying to get them to leave our orientation and go to theirs. He said, so now what's happening is people, when they get home at night, they're getting all the voicemails, and some of the guys don't come back the next day. Y you know what that tells me? That tells me the driver talked to those other companies. So my goal is to be the first company that a driver talks to and the last. Because as long as he's talking with other recruiters, you're creating your own competition, and you're going to have drivers sitting in orientation taking phone calls from other recruiters. So, you know, when I look at some of you have seen my pyramid where I, I have at the top COC, that's cream of the crop. In the middle, PGGs, that's pretty good guys and pretty good gals. And in the bottom, NITL, that stands for not in this lifetime. <laughs> and uh, But what we've found is the longer it takes you from hello to man, John, based on what I'm seeing here, I don't see any reason we could take this the next step. The longer that period of time, the lower the quality of driver you get to recruit because the good ones are gone. Let's go to the, to the next slide. <clears throat> You know, uh, one of the things that, that we do with, with, with Ramsey, we have call source, call tracking. And now I've seen this for years, and now through call tracking, uh, I, I see it real time. And, when you know, 50% of callers, over 50% of callers hang up when they get voicemail. Here's another one. Over 50% hang up when they get an automated phone system as well. So you're, you want to increase your leads um, in recruiting, get rid of your automated phone system. Have the 800 number ring directly to a person within your recruiting department or within your department. Um, folks, empty trucks is not solely a recruiting problem. Empty trucks is a company problem. Look at the missed opportunities we have, the lower revenue that we have. So with that in mind, um, when I was over the recruiting department at CFI, we had, you know, the, the, the recruiting calls went through the recruiters, went through my processors, went through my supervisor, went through me, and then went through all the other managers in safety and landed on our vice president's desk. You know what? It was not, and of course, they were able to do that in milliseconds. Uh, and I'll tell you what, our vice president uh, did, not, did not mind taking recruiting calls if we were all on the phone. <laughs> it was impressed upon me that if he ever caught recruiting calls and looked down there and we're all just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, it wouldn't be good for me. And uh, so I just made sure that never happened because I wasn't interested in what that meant. So, but, but folks, what if, give, give folks understanding, we can't have this recruiting line ring into a voicemail. If, if we're on the phone, it's going to cover to you and it's going to cover to the next person. And some of you, maybe it's going to cover right up to the owner of the company. And um, but it's that important, and so there's a little little point to that that a lot of folks don't realize that you lose a lot of calls when they go to voicemail. Referrals. The the, the this is a you talk about silver bullets. There's, these next two slides are as close to silver bullets as there are in recruiting, and and you got to do it right. So, so catch this. The way to get driver referrals is to ask drivers personally and privately for their help. I've sat in orientation undercover as a truck driver, as we mentioned a few, little bit ago, my undercover trucker thing, and the recruiter has walked up to us, and there, there, was, there was me and three other guys that this recruiter had, had recruited, and he walked up to us, and he says, hey, guys, man, I appreciate you being here, appreciate you coming, and I just wonder if you'd do me a favor. 
if you see anybody out there that you would refer, just give them my name and give me their name, and here's these packets. And so he gave us these really nice packets that had um, these you know, cards in it and flyers and such and, and things we could rip off and tear off and, and give and share, all that. Here's what's interesting. When the other folks threw away their lunch plates, they threw all that away too. Now, on the other hand, I'm sitting in an orientation up in Iowa, and the recruiter brought each of us in individually and printed, had, had gone to at Office Depot, you get those 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper and that, that are perforated for business cards, and it, it was all set up with the company logo and all that stuff. All she had to do was enter my name in there, and she printed out two sheets of that, ripped them apart, and what did it give me? 20 business cards or something, but it had my name on it. And she said, hey, I made these cards for you, and, and, and I wonder if you'd do me a favor. And she asked me personally and privately for my help with driver referrals. So there I am sitting out later, sitting out there at the um, picnic table as everybody's you know, kind of waiting for the other guys to get through with their meetings, and everybody's swapping business cards, and they're all saying, you know what, she asked me if I'd help her uh, you know, find referrals, and she gave me these cards, and you know what? I will. I, I, I'll help her out. Now, folks, I know some recruiters at some, at some companies that they ask their drivers personally and privately for their help in driver referrals. And, um, uh, you know, one recruiter, that's, she, she was actually working out of her home office, and that's the only way she could get drivers. And it took her about two months to get, get, the, get the pipeline working. But after that, she was recruiting as many drivers per week as a recruiter sitting in the office taking advertising phone calls. So um, th that asking personally and privately helps. Um, get the driver managers to help. You know, they should ask the drivers that report to them, hey, John, I need your help. Man, we got more freight than we can say, freight over, uh, say grace over. Uh, man, g g give me some help here. Will you do that for me? People are committed to people, not to companies, and they'll do it for you if you personally and privately ask them uh, for their help. The next one, um, if, if anybody's heard me talking in, 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 in a speech about, um, about recruiting, I typically have those two points in there. Rehires is our next one. And this is one of the things I see a lot of fleets do wrong. Uh, a lot of fleets wait until the drivers call them and say, hey, yeah, I quit, you know, can I, should, should I come back, you know, can I come back? And the, um, you know, so then they say, well, we'll get an application from you. Then we'll let everybody in the company vote on it. And as a result, you, you end up with a very low number of referrals, and you end up with, with a lot of guys that are voted no. If you want to have a high quality and a high quantity of, of rehires, when that driver quits, decide right then, do you want them back? Now, i got to tell you, I went to my boss and I said, Bruce, if you can trust me to and my team to hire drivers that we don't know, can't you trust me to rehire drivers that we do know? And he says, you know what, you got a good point there. If you have any questions, give me a call. And I became the rehire review board at CFI. And so when I, had, I did all the voluntary and involuntary resignations as well. And so right then I decided I'd look at their file. And um, if I saw something in there that made me go, huh, well, I'd call the department. I'd call, you know, payroll or safety or operations. Hey, what's going on with this guy? And depending on what I heard, I'd decide if we're going to offer a rehire. And if we were, I gave the file uh, to Jerry Magard, my recruiter, that was in charge of rehires. And Jerry, 30 days from the day that that driver quit, would send the, uh, the rehire letter. And folks, if you want the rehire letter, shoot me an email and I'll flip it at you. Um, the, 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 the magic of the rehire letter, there's two things you've got to do on this. Number one is the timing. 75% of turnover happens in the first 90 days of employment. So we're hitting them at 30 days before they've decided this isn't working out, we're catching them before they've made the decision to go somewhere else. And about that time when they're thinking, you know, it wasn't so bad over there. You know, I know those folks, it, they, they really weren't that bad. And so 
the timing is important. Number two is the verbiage. The verbiage is saying, is, is in my third paragraph of my letter, and it basically says, John, the purpose of this letter is to advise you, let you know that the Rehire Review Board has already voted yes for your return. Uh, so a simple telephone call could get you back in one of our trucks where you belong. And so it removes the fear of rejection as well. So it's the timing and the verbiage that make that frankly magical. <laughs> I mean, it works. Um, the next time to send it's December 1st because many drivers uh, start a new job come January 1. And last is any time you have a change, I would send out the rehire letter uh, to to you know every driver that quit, talking to them about the pay change, the area of operation change, such like that. Now there's another group of drivers I'd send it to as well, and that's those that took other employment. Um, those are the guys that you wanted but disappeared. Most recruiters, once the guy disappears, they just forget about them. They file it and forget. Well, there's a um, huge, huge number there of folks that 30 days later, they're going to wish, um, you know, they're going to be thinking it's not working out where they're at. So send them a letter, the same, same like the rehire letter, that basically says, um, hey, John, you know, lost contact with you. Hope everything's okay. Um, if it's not, give me a call. I'd still like to talk with you about you know getting in one of our trucks. So the the, the took other employment letters is powerful as well. Last point I want to talk about here is your is motivating your staff. Now you heard me talk earlier about the whiteboard, um, and when I talked about with the driver, yeah, you won't be here on the 17th. Well, I'm going to put you on the board, folks. Put a, put a whiteboard in your recruiting department that shows the next couple of orientation dates. And when we're talking to a driver and we set a plan of action for that driver that, okay, so, so you're going to be here on, this, on the 17th. That's what we're shooting for. So everything that we're doing from right here until the 17th is all aimed at getting you here on the 17th. So you're going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and we're, you're going to call me back at this time. But then that time you I'm going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to call me back at this time. Um, it's all going toward that date you know there their name is on the board you can change the color you know that's indicating different statuses but what it does for us is at a glance we can see what our pipelines looking like and I don't want to take these folks off my board and so I'm going to do everything I can to get them to the finish line and get them showing up in class the next thing is I call it the five minute morning meeting and folks it's a stand-up meeting so, you know, and you can take this to, across your entire company. How do you define success? Is what, do you, what is it that you do that helps our company, helps move our company forward every day? You know, I, there are six divisions of impact. And every morning we have a five-minute stand-up morning meeting, and every morning we report key performance indicators. And what that does is it helps us all keep our eye on the ball of the things that move us forward. Uh, with my staff, um, when I was running the recruiting department, every morning we had a five-minute stand-up meeting, and we would go around the table, and people would say, I got this many, uh, I got this many drivers on the board, this many more possible, all the way around. And then I would report, um, we've got, okay, so we've got this many on. Uh, uh, in orientation this week, we got this many empty trucks. We're going to net this many empty trucks by the time we fill orientation. We got this many confirmed for next week, and this many more possible. Hey, and by the way, this is what's going on in the fleet. Okay, great. Let's get after it. You know what it does? Every day it sets that sense of urgency, and it showed us where we were. It kind of showed the light at the end of the tunnel. Without that, people are just coming in, and they're just going through the motions. Here we go again, waiting for the phone to ring, and I'm going to start going through the motions again. So, folks, it really, it, it sounds like a simple thing, but from a motivational standpoint, it really helps keep our eye on the ball and, and keeps us focused on what, it, how, on what it is that we do every day to drive our success. With that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions, and I think there's a Q&A tab here 
that maybe some holy cow there has been some questions <laughs> put on here i'm going to pull them open sharon and kent how do we handle this yeah kelly i'm going to talk real briefly about some upcoming webinars while any of the attendees who haven't submitted questions that want to can and then we'll start processing those okay. so first of all uh, the next upcoming webinar is march 18th it is our transportation spotlight this is where we are providing information about our 2015 um, employee benchmarking report. It's a survey we conduct every year. I think we've been doing it for seven or eight years and provide some good information for you to be able to compare your screening program against your peers. That'll be conducted by Stephen Spencer, our Vice President of Transportation. So you want to be sure and, uh, and register for that webinar. After that, July 23rd is our legislative and regulatory update. It's something we do annually. Our speaker, uh, Dave Oshecki, is the Executive Vice President of the American Trucking Association, so that will be in July. And then if you uh, like to visit our website, um, uh, you can access blogs and recorded past webinars, uh, white papers, and more information at the URL at the bottom of this screen. So with that, let's um, let's see if we can field some questions. Do you have any that you can Yeah, I, I like see a whole with? bunch here. Yeah, I just start at the bottom. Oops. Uh, Kent, do you want to ask, do you want to read them? And just ask me as you go through there, or does Sharon do that, or do I just read some and go and answer them here? It keeps it keeps jumping as people are adding new ones to the top, so maybe I should go there. How can I get a copy of the rehire letter you referenced? I see several people asking for that. I do see emails here. Um, I think Sharon and, and Kent will send me this list, then I'll, I'll go ahead and blast it at you. I'll send it out to everybody that's asking for it here. Is, Here, is that, here's a question, a Kelly. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, I have a question. Uh, any theories on why turnover continues to increase in the industry? Well, w one reason you're going to see a lot of it um, right now is because the demand is so high. Uh, you know, you look at 2010 when we, we were in a recession and nobody was – um, nobody was hiring drivers, and all at once we were all, wow, look at this. We, our turnover rates dropped 50% of where it was. And my, I was saying to folks, yeah, but what did you do to get it there? And the answer was nothing. The, 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 it wasn't that drivers were afraid to make a change, which is what was being reported many times. Um, the reason turnover was low was because fleets weren't hiring. Now I mean, uh, every fleet out there is looking for drivers, and so if a guy wants, he has any inclination, he wants to make a change, uh, he has that opportunity. Uh, number two, to know this, kind of a side note to that, uh, fleets are looking at their compensation package on a quarterly basis. There has never been, according to Gordon Klimp, who does the American Driver Wage Survey, there's never been a time of so many adjustments and such rapid adjustments to um, driver compensation as there is now. Uh, now, the other reason, what's the, you know, what's the leading reasons for driver turnover? You have a lack of appreciation and lack of respect are the number one and number two reasons for, for driver uh, turnover. And it, through, the, through the years, it continues to be, be the same. But secondly, you know, driver-dispatcher dri relationship, driver-fleet manager relationship. One of the problems we have in trucking is that our fleet managers have more direct report employees than any other person in the company, yet they take less responsibility for their employee than anybody else in the company. Uh, and they're, held, they're, they're not empowered to, a lot of times, and they're not held accountable either. By the way, if you're not going to empower them, don't hold them accountable because that's, that's a re real recipe for disaster. So. I think there's lots of opportunity out there, and number two, we've really got to start addressing the root cause of turnover, um, which is driver-dispatcher relationship and respect and appreciation. That's a short answer to that. 
good information. Here's another one. Do you believe the most effective, it is most effective to have recruiters under recruiting, retention supervisor, or under operations supervisor? You know, good, good question. I, um, <laughs> it's, it's, wow, it's funny you asked that one. It, either, I have found that more and more, um, I have found that recruiting is reporting to operations. And one of the thoughts there, and frankly, you know, if the operations manager is in is is in charge of recruiting, then they get a chance to feel the pain that's caused by fleet managers that are running off drivers. Uh, but the other side, I can see why it is most typically in what we refer to as safety, and safety is is split into two different groups, loss prevention and human resources, uh, because of the, you know, the legal ramifications uh, that are related to what we do in recruiting. Uh, you need to have somebody that, that, that is an expert in that field. I will say this, if you, you want to make sure, I mean, safety's got to have a say-so on the qualifications of the drivers that are being recruited. I also think they ought to have skin in that game because when I have seen when safety has no skin in that game, they can sit over here and say, well, from a risk standpoint, they, you know, I'm not saying yes to any of this. They got to have this, 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 and this, and they become, they can become unrealistic. So there, there has to be this scale between driver quality, you know, what you're willing to accept and the risk. And, and that's, you, know, you look for that equilibrium and look to keep it realistic. So uh, I guess the short answer, Kent, is I find it more often in safety than in operations. Um, and both work. But you, but you do have to uh, – but I, I do think that safety ought to have some skin in the game, and frankly, operations as well, so that – from a risk standpoint and from a driver turnover standpoint, there's accountability to people that are pulling the strings. Good point. Yep. Here's another one. We have held job fairs to hire drivers at hotels in local areas where we need drivers. We've advertised in truck stops and on Craigslist. Results have been very poor with regard to response. Did we do something wrong, or is this a poor recruiting tool? Short answer, you did something wrong. Next question. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, I'll tell you what. That's interesting that they, that they made that question. Uh, did you guys hear, and I know everybody can't answer me, but you want to see what type of world we're in right now, driver shortage? When you hear Walmart advertising on XM that they're doing a hiring fair in Pennsylvania, you know we've got a driver shortage going on. And I'll tell you what's going on with Walmart, because they were in my recruiting center six years ago, at least six years ago, and he was sitting in there to learn how to recruit. And the audience is like, what in the world are you doing here? He says, we are looking at a higher turnover rate, which means they're going to, about, going to be around 2% or so, <laughs> turnover rate, and there's nothing we can do about it. And that the reason why was retirement, and that's why you're seeing Walmart doing increased recruiting because they're having increased retirement. That's from a guy from an outsider, you know, um, knowing what they said when they were in my recruiting center. Um, folks, I find there are a few folks that are trying the old hotel thing again. And if you're looking for students and unemployed drivers, you know, I would think um, maybe that would be. A, Effective. I've heard some folks that are doing them. I've also heard people that are doing um, job fairs at their terminals. But the truth is, you know, when you when you do the the digital that we talked about earlier, you're casting a wider net, and you're in your uh, you're getting a chance to talk to not only the drivers that are working that can't make it to that event during certain hours, but also then to those that could have made it to the event. So I'm really not a huge fan of, and I would not do it. I'm not, that's not something I'm recommending to fleets, to, to do a hotel um, job fair thing. Um, 
you know, if you want to do something at your local terminal on a Saturday and have a hiring blitz and you blitz it out big time, uh, you can try that, but just know that your numbers are going to be lower because that requires people to come to you at a, during a specific date and time, and so that limits your, your results. So they answer the okay. rest of what you did right or wrong. I'd have to see the campaign. Okay. And, and Ken, I think we're up against. I regret it. We're up against it. Um, but you got. I think you're. Did you say earlier? You, you folks are going to send me all these questions, and I will answer each person individually. It may take me a couple of days because there's a lot of them here. Yeah, we'll certainly. We've got a lot of questions, and we'll certainly uh, send those on to Kelly and have him respond. Uh, also, remind everyone attending that you'll get an email tomorrow with uh, a link to the recorded session that you can listen to this.